Right. So we're about a third of the way through this PDF number 18 on acoustic full wave finite difference modeling. Uh, after this, we'll go into some examples which are uh, posted on the um, on the online um, syllabus uh, for the current condition and the uh, um, uh, what do you call it? The uh, grid dispersion. Okay. So we have a um, a this is a, a simple um, uh, sort of half homogeneous. It's homogeneous in uh, in density. A half homogeneous scalar wave equation here. D squared p dt squared is equal to c squared uh, del squared p. So uh, you know, as a wave equation, it's a relationship between the time derivative of the pressure field and, the, and spatial derivatives of the pressure field. So it's obviously solved by, uh, um, uh, it's a second order wave equation, so it's obviously solved by um, uh, sines and cosines uh, in space and time. And that's where the, the waves come from. So our acoustic 2D difference approximation comes about from these operators, as I defined last time. And uh, so let's write out the homogeneous 2D expression. All right. So we have uh, the time difference, the second time difference on the left side. Um, yeah, here we go. So there's the operators applied to, you know, for the second time difference uh, on the left, and then there's uh, the, uh, the spatially variable velocity c squared, and then here's the um, uh, the Hamiltonian uh, that's on the right hand side with the second uh, uh, second derivatives in in x and z. So um, what we end up with is uh, is a um, a second uh, uh, derivative in time, second difference in time that's centered at t, uh, x and z. Right? It goes. It involves t minus one uh, at x and z, and t plus one at x and z, and t at x and z. Okay. So it's centered at t, and then uh, we collect our various um, constants: delta t squared, c squared. Uh, which can still be variable in space and uh, h squared. Okay, that's the uh, spatial um, spatial sampling interval. Both delta x and delta z are both equal to h. Um, and then here's the uh, the difference operator. Uh, first, second uh, second difference uh, uh, centered in in time around z, and the second difference. Uh, no, I'm sorry. This one's around x, and then this one is still centered at t, but it's around z. So uh, both, you know, all terms, uh, both sides, are centered at uh, x, z, and t uh, by virtue of uh, of how these are done. So this is just the simplest way possible. Um, and we let uh, alpha or a squared equal be equal to delta t squared over h squared. And so then we have uh, p uh, uh, p at x and z at t minus one plus p at x and z at t plus one uh, plus now now I'm I'm breaking out all the different terms. Here's uh, everything that is uh, being done to uh, p of um, of uh, uh, p at uh, t x and z right. So that's two times the quantity two a squared c squared uh, minus one, and then uh, there's this uh, um, this coefficient minus a squared c squared, which gets applied to all these four terms, uh, p at uh, t and x minus one z, p at t and x plus one z, p at t and x z minus one, p at t and x and z plus one. Okay. That's all set to zero. So as we remember from 706, these coefficients now uh, of the whole thing set to zero, the, those are the terms of the differencing star, the coefficients of the differencing star. 
So you can see the uh, and and here you know the star is three D. So I have to break it out. Here's the t minus one part. Here's the t part and the t plus one part, right? And, and you can see the coefficient at t minus one and t plus one is just one. That's easy. At t, then uh, we're looking over here, and uh, right in the middle we've got that two times the quantity two a squared c squared minus one, and uh, and then for the four surrounding ones, and uh, did I forget to put the no? Let's see. Yeah, it looks like I forgot to put the uh, the minus sign on the on the uh, a squared c squares. Okay, on the, on those four surrounding the uh, the center at t, those should all have uh, minus signs on them. Uh, alternatively, of course, you can. Put a minus sign on uh, you, you know, because the whole thing equals zero, right? So I can multiply each term by minus one, and I could leave those alone, and take the one at uh, t z and uh, and x, and make that negative, make the t minus one uh, uh, coefficient negative, and make the t plus one coefficient negative. Any way you like, it's just got to be equal to zero. Um, so this star, it's called second order in time, and it's also second order in x and z, just being the very simple uh, uh, second difference, right? The uh, in general, you take uh, uh, <coughs> uh, dx uh, plus and dx minus, and you take dz plus and dz minus, okay, and those are Those are going to give you uh, the uh, the second, the true second derivative in each direction, plus terms that are on the order of h squared. So that's why we call it second order. Okay. You can also see it's second order because it has, uh, you know, it's uh, two plus one is the number of, uh, um, you know, three is the number of, of samples that it uses out of the data. Um, and here's. Uh, you know, here's the kind of the root of a second order, uh, um, the root of a second order uh, uh, different star. <clears throat> you know, the uh, uh, the center accounts uh, four times as much as the uh, as the edges. Um, now we saw that the second difference dx squared matches in seven oh six. We it matched. Uh, uh, you know, d squared uh, the 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 second derivative best at k sub x equals zero, which means you know no uh, no slope in x, okay, infinite apparent velocity, uh, and then um, you know the estimated from the second difference you get an estimated wave number k hat at uh, at x, right? The 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 second difference it's giving you an estimate of the of the second derivative, and since in the Fourier domain the second derivative is basically uh, multiplying by the uh, uh, the the wave number uh, uh, squared, okay, um, that means that the uh, the second uh, difference is also giving you an estimate of the wave number, uh, in this case k sub x. And we call it k. We call it estimate k sub x hat. So the ratio of k sub x uh, over uh, k sub x hat over k sub x is pi over two. We showed that by substituting a mode into um, into the difference equation, uh, and you know e to the i uh, omega into the difference equation. Actually, e to the i k times x. Or k sub x times x, we substituted that into the second difference, and we pulled out this relationship. So at the Nyquist, it's really it's really a long way off. It's it's significantly overestimating the um, uh, the wave number. Okay, you know, three point one four over two. That's uh, that's more than half off. Fifty um, percent error. 
we can get a, a fourth order scheme. Okay, so this is you know this is not good enough for a lot of places, right? So for a lot of wave numbers that are cutting through, you know, not parallel to x, not parallel to z, you know, this is really not going to be good enough. Okay, we're going to be too close to the Nyquist. Um, so uh, if we if we want to um, if we want to get a better approximation of the uh, of the higher frequencies, the higher spatial frequencies, or the higher time frequencies, for that matter, instead of a uh, a second order scheme, we got to we got to uh, go up to uh, upgrade to a fourth order scheme. So here's a fourth order scheme in um, in uh, uh, x and z, okay, uh, which we could substitute in. Um, so uh, you know, it's it's uh, in, instead of um, uh, instead of taking the simple solution, the simple substitution for uh, you know dt. Uh, oh, oh no no, this is the this is the whole equation, right? So we have uh, the second time derivative over here, still second order, and then here is is writing out the fourth order scheme, and you can see what we've done here. We've taken remember back in seven hundred six when we did the uh, uh, I know that was a long time ago. Um, we did the, um, the 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 Taylor series. We expanded the uh, difference operator about it. The, the the we expanded expanded the um, um, the derivative around the finite difference operator, and then we just took the first term. Okay, here's including the second term, right? So that's where that h squared over twelve comes from, right? That Twelve is uh, what is it? Three factorial? No, four factorial. Um, something like that. So uh, um, we have uh, uh, you know applied to for the uh, for the for the second difference in x, we're going to take um, p at uh, t x and z, and we're going to apply. Um, we're definitely going to apply. See that we have. One times uh, so that means uh, p at x and at t x and z, and we're definitely going to apply uh, 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 d squared uh, uh, this you know d squared x big d squared x, okay, d minus and then d plus, um, but we're going to subtract from it this correction factor, which is is small right h squared over twelve that's you know, h is small to begin with. H squared is is way smaller, and then we divide that by twelve, right? So this is a, a tiny little less than one percent correction. Okay. Um, uh, although you know, at higher frequencies, it does play more of a uh, more of a role, um, and that correction then is uh, is made after an additional. It's like uh, this is. Uh, Really getting us uh, the fourth derivative of the wave field, right? So it, we're estimating the second derivative via a second difference with a correction that's dependent on the fourth derivative of the wave field, okay? Because there's an additional uh, d minus dx applied there, and then the same thing at uh, uh, in the z difference, okay? So that's a fourth order scheme, and uh, finally, um, it's. Uh, uh, you know, among among the codes that um, that actually are still straight um, finite difference, um, the um, it's it's Livermore's WP four code that is uh, uh, fourth order in space, all three dimensions, and also fourth order in time, which is nice. Okay, so they've really done the proper job now. That's the only one that's uh, of the of the approaches that are that are you know sort of traditional finite difference, uh, that's the only one that's uh, that's truly fourth order. Okay, <clears throat> so being fourth order, to estimate any second derivative, instead of using three points, right, like three points in x, you're, we're now using five points in x. We're using five points in z. Now this scheme is still using just three points in time. Okay. So uh, um, and of course a fourth order 
um, fourth order calculation in time would have to use five time slices. Okay, so four previous ones, and the and you still have the one hanging out that you're calculating. So uh, <clears throat> you know we've got uh, for this for this program, which is uh, it's in RG. It's called uh, AMOD, acoustic modeling. <clears throat> Um, DT is still second order, um, and the uh, the higher uh, order spatial derivatives reduce grid dispersion, which I'll describe later for you um, in uh, in a little more detail. So uh, you know we can still explicitly solve for uh, the next time step uh, p at x z and t plus one, or we can solve for the previous time step uh, p at uh, x and z and t minus one. And the um, the codes I've been using lately, you know, they're a little bit old, so they're still using the Clayton Enquist uh, boundary conditions, where the uh, the dispersion curve gets monkeyed with to only allow waves to propagate out of the of the area of calculation, uh, and that's usually been supplemented um, um, or uh, or replaced with a uh, um, uh, by adding. Um, uh, zones around the edges with uh, with very high uh, um, uh, very high uh, or I'm sorry very low Q. Okay, so a lot of uh, a lot of dispersion, a lot of uh, losses of seismic wave energy. You know, maybe Q of one. Um, I'm just wondering how does frequency come into play here? I don't really see like how this would behave differently. Well, I was talking about low spatial frequency and high spatial frequency. Okay. But I know these codes, you know, you can put in different frequencies, but I, I'm just not seeing how how that would work. Right. So so when you have different frequencies of the sort, right, this is this is just the propagator, right? I haven't talked about imposing the source, have I? No. So so you know that that is often done um, you know, kind of heuristically, um, by by simply uh, having a uh, a source. What these uh, you know, like these acoustic ones, they're calculating pressure. The elastic ones are calculating. Um, um, well, there's different versions, but uh, uh, I'm I'm going to talk about it as if it's calculating just uh, particle velocity. Okay. Um, you know, I started developing uh, the uh, the elastic wave equation for uh, for uh, um, what's it called um, uh, displacement, uh, but actually most of these calculations use velocity, and and actually the reason they do that is um, because they they want to impose the source as a particle velocity, so the source becomes a particle velocity imposed, and of course. Uh, what do you think happens if, if you impose that sort? Let's let's say you've got an explosion, right? It's at a small point. It's much large. It's much smaller than your grid spacing h. Okay, and so what would happen? Do you think if you impose this explosion at uh, at one single point? I mean, think back to lab six. I think no, it's lab uh, lab eight of uh, of. Uh, um, of 706. So if you kind of kick this off and then you just, you just have a point in the middle of the star? Well, you, you, I mean, a star gets applied everywhere in the whole calculation field, 2D or 3D, yeah. right? So, so that's happening. The star gets applied to get the next time step. It gets applied everywhere at every time step. So you're saying you start with a model with just one point and then you take the next time step. Yeah, you, you one point you you impose the uh, the source time function. So it may be it may be over uh, a thousand time steps, but that one point, you know, you're setting that uh, uh, you're setting the the particle velocity or the pressure there. Okay, and so uh, what what's going to happen then if you if you impose that pressure over exactly one isolated uh, point? So what happens is uh, 
uh, it's, you know, that point is completely spatially aliased, right? And so it, it blows away, you know, even if you use a fourth order uh, different scheme, you know, the, uh, the, the schemes just cannot correctly calculate the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the actual high, fre you know, very high spatial frequency, um, very high spatial frequency um, um, case, wave numbers, right? The, the, whether it's a second order scheme or a fourth order scheme, they all fail to get a correct estimate of the, of the wave number. Um, in either direction, in any any of the three directions, so um, you just get you just get artifacts. Remember that you put it in the point, and it just sprays into a bunch of artifacts, uh, which is just complete spatial aliasing. So you have to impose over a kind of smooth source region. You know. I guess, I guess I'm just not understanding how this this method would even know the difference between, like, if I had a I had a you know a wave number where my wave is great is wider than this star. Yeah. And how would this know the difference between one that's the length of the star and one that's wider than the star? Ah, okay. I don't really understand how the frequency comes in to the, the spatial frequency even. Yeah, I don't really get it. I'll 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 give you an illustration in these uh, okay. in these next lectures. So okay. it, you may have to hold on till tomorrow, but you will see it. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, um, that's the uh, scheme used by AMOD, which uh, Clayton wrote uh, um, many, many years ago, many, many decades ago. Um, and it's still uh, an extremely useful, um, an extremely useful uh, uh, procedure. Oh, I never. Um, Good grief. Um, I never rectified this. Um, oh, I just need to uh, rotate this page. Um, yes, you're right. Okay. So um, here's uh, here's like uh, Clayton. I, I think Dave Brown worked on this too. Um, they're both uh, um, Clairvaux PhDs who uh, became professors at Caltech at about the same time. Um, so you know, Clairvaux really uh, has a pretty incredible legacy. Uh, academically. So uh, this is a, uh, a shot gather. I think uh, the, uh, the source must be buried, right? Because the first arrival is a, is a, uh, is a hyperbola. And uh, using the second order code, uh, which uh, runs a bit faster, right? Because it's only got to look at, at every grid point at every time step, it's only got to look at uh, three by three or three plus three uh, elements. Uh, actually, a total of five elements. Whereas the fourth order, right? It's got to look at uh, um, uh, five plus five minus one, right? So nine elements. So it takes um, uh, it takes twice as long. Okay, the, the down there in the in the loops in the innermost loop, it takes twice as long. Um, and these have both been, you know, optimized to the same extent um, in their calculation. In fact, uh, uh, Clayton would take his uh, his inner um, his innermost loop calculation, and uh, he would have the compiler uh, write out the assembler, and then he would uh, pick it apart and, and optimize it by hand, and then plug the assembler back into the uh, into the full calculation. And get, uh, you know, usually a um, uh, five or ten times speed up just by doing that. Um, so, uh, uh, and you can see that uh, where k is um, 
uh, so this is time going down and x going across. And where kx is, is uh, larger at the flanks of these hyperbolas, okay, um, you can see this, uh, there's this uh, uh, multi-cyclic character that comes out. But that's not in the source. That's, that's what's called grid dispersion. It's an error, an artifact that comes out. Um, and uh, uh, so they, uh, you know, comparing it with the fourth order case, all right, and uh, you can see there's still some grid dispersion on the flanks, but it's not too bad. And uh, so that's, uh, you know, it's a better solution. Uh, more accurate solution, even though it takes uh, takes a bit longer. Uh, notice that the grid dispersion really has a big effect on this, uh, the amplitude of this reflector down here, um, and that's uh, that's pretty serious. Okay. What are those x's in the fourth order? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a curious thing. I was just trying to remember. I think that's. Um, yeah, I think it's the side, but notice their uh, their uh, um, hyperbolas, yeah. and they're centered here. Like yeah. you know, here's the hyperbola centered at the side. That's clearly a side uh, reflection. Okay. Um, maybe that's the. Uh, could that be the corner? You know, this is where a reflector meets the side. Could that be the corner cube reflection from that uh, yeah. from that corner? It looks like it may be a diffraction of something. Yeah, it's a diffraction of something. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I have to go back to uh, Clayton and and uh, Brown's paper. Although this, this may be out of an SEP volume as well. Um, what? But you can get a lot of SEP volumes online too. Um, okay. So. Um, that's uh, uh, you know that's an early example of how to make these calculations more accurate. Now, what is this? What is this really doing for us? This uh, grid dispersion, it's really a limitation on the frequency. If you go with a, if you calculate a much lower frequency source, this is like a Ricker wavelet put into this. Um, and if you go with a much lower frequency source, then you don't see this grid dispersion. So the, the criterion for avoiding grid dispersion in the second order calculation, spatial calculation, is that you have to avoid, um, you have to have at least 20 grid points per wavelength okay, for the second order. So uh, um, you know, if you want to calculate a certain wavelength, you need to divide the grid in much more finely. right? And um, and that makes the calculation take uh, you know for two D four times as long and for three D eight times as long. You know if you um, if you have to have your uh, um, you know to fit uh, twenty points into those wavelengths, if you have to have h, then the three D calculation is going to take eight times as long, and the and the um, the two D calculation is going to take four times as long. All right. So by not having to, and the uh, fourth order means that you only need six points per wavelength. Okay, so that's like a three times you can get three times higher frequency just by uh, for the same computing uh, uh, effort. You can get three times higher frequency by going to fourth order in space. And these these examples obviously are pushing the calculation to uh, you know uh, really a higher frequency than it can bear because you can see grid dispersion on both on both of them. It's just much much worse on the uh, on the uh, second order. So the fourth order may actually be faster. Yes, yes, because of the you know the calculation time is. Is a factor of the. Um, it's a, it's a it's a factor of the. Um, the the total number of grid points, right? Which is going to be, you know, the square or or uh, or the.
the cube of the dimension of the grid. Um, and then the, uh, uh, yeah, um, there's other factors that affect the number of time points you need. So in fact, that's what I wanted to look at, look at next, is this uh, uh, so-called current condition. All right? It's basically uh, an anti-aliasing condition. Um, so uh, uh, this is the, we'll come back to grid dispersion, but first we got to look at the, uh, uh, you know, how's our time sampling, right? We're, we're only doing our, um, our uh, second, uh, our second order difference is done in second order in time. And of course, why couldn't we just, uh, why couldn't we just put in a very large delta t and proceed directly from our source to our our result? You know, when, you know, why why do we, you know, how finely do we have to jump over all the, the time steps? And the answer here is is really just simple aliasing, okay. Um, and uh, uh, here's a uh, a wave in space. You can see that uh, it's a it's a sinusoid. The the thick uh, blue curve is a is a sinusoid, and it's um, uh, it's got a wavelength lambda, and of course uh, this wave is propagating. So you know the velocity of propagation is uh, the frequency times the uh, the wavelength, all right. And here you see if you sample it two times per wavelength, okay. So in this wavelength, there's one there, one there, and then there's the beginning of the next wavelength, okay. Two times per wavelength, right? This light green line is a pretty good approximation, okay. Um, you know, this is just a review of basic aliasing here, right? Uh, on the other hand, um, if we sample it at, uh, uh, I think this is one and a half times per wavelength, not two times per wavelength, but less, one and a half times per wavelength. So, uh, you know, this wavelength here gets sampled there, and then there, and this wavelength, this particular wavelength only gets sampled once, right? And so we draw straight lines connecting those, and you can see that we're, we've got a representation of a lower frequency wave. That's not there. Okay. If we actually uh, do that sampling, that's uh, not uh, not frequent enough. Okay. So, um, uh, and that's a demonstration of wraparound, right? It's taken the energy of this wave at a higher frequency and it's wrapped it to an apparent lower frequency because of our poor sampling. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, you know, so whereas uh, whereas this green approximation of the sine wave is adequate enough, the uh, the red one is completely uh, fallacious. Um, uh, and um, you know, is completely an error. So uh, uh, the word is here in in E three D. And other uh, finite difference uh, computations that are entirely in the physical domain that don't, you know, that are that uh, are finite difference, not finite element, and that are uh, not in the Fourier domain. Okay, the st the time step dt. Okay, it must be short enough to properly represent the waves being modeled. Okay, and um, the velocity at any point in the model is related to the wavelength. So the, the higher the velocity, the longer the wavelength. And, and of course, you know the Nyquist criterion, uh, which says that a discrete representation of a wave in time must have a sampling frequency, call it f sub s, that provides two points per period at least. Okay, f sub s is equal to two times f max, where f max is the highest frequency found in the waves. Okay. And if you're sampling at uh, one over dt, um, so um, uh, f sub s is one over dt, right? Um, okay. So for these modeling, uh, these modeling, um, uh, uh, these modeling procedures, they have this uh, current condition, 
and I don't, I haven't looked up who Courant it, uh, was or is. All right, and the condition states that the time sampling dt must be small enough that the longest wavelengths, the longest wavelengths propagating at the highest velocity that you have in your grid, okay, do not outrun the spatial grid sampling. Okay, so you've got to have, you know, in time and space, you've got to still have two, two, uh, um, two samples per uh, wavelength. All right, and the wavelength gets longer as the velocity goes up. Okay, and as and uh, so uh, you're more likely to outrun your uh, your DH. All right. Now there's also a, 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 a depending on whether you have a second order or fourth order um, approximation that makes adjustments to the current condition, okay, and um, um, you know it's it's just uh, essentially a, a Nyquist criteria, all right. So uh, uh, it's it's going to be related to uh, uh, it's it's going to be something close to um, um, you know, since v equals f lambda, um, you're going to take uh, uh, dt times uh, v max, and that's going to give you a first uh, estimate uh, of lambda. And you take uh, uh, dt times v max and divide it by two, then you know your uh, your time sampling has to be uh, th no that uh, let's see. So then we need f, right? So um, um, let's see. So f is one over uh, um, dt. So uh, uh, um, uh, oh, and lambda is uh, dx, right? So um, your uh, dt is going to have to be less than, um, uh, and the very maximum it could ever be would be uh, v max uh, over um, uh, over delta x, or, or yeah, v max over 2 delta x, right? You still need two samples. Um, oh, wait a minute, that's uh, it be lambda. Yeah, yeah, 2 delta x. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was I hadn't inverted uh, f yet. So the sampling has to be less than. Not. Yeah, it has to be less than. I mean, you can see right away it has to be less than half that. Okay, yeah. and usually it's uh, you know, um, it's substantially less than that. Uh, uh, you know, I think three eighths is a maximum. Um, so those are, uh, and there's various factors that come in because of the, uh, uh, you know, we saw we saw current conditions when we were developing conditions on DT for uh, uh, for finite difference migration, and this is the uh, this is the same thing. All right. So let's uh, let's take a look at this grid dispersion. Okay, um, you know, with that with that background, right? We we're we're going to see here that we need a lot of time sent steps, and we're also going to see here that we need a very small dh. So all of that puts um, uh, puts limits on our. Uh, I mean, that's really what sets the. The computational difficulty of these calculations. Okay, so so we see that the the higher the velocities we have, that brings us uh, that brings us difficulty. Okay, and now it turns out that that effectively the low velocities are also going to bring us difficulty. Okay, because of this grid dispersion. All right. Um, remember uh, uh, what I said about grid dispersion before. To avoid it, 
in the fourth order calculation, you need at least six points per wavelength. Okay, so at low velocities, you have um, you have smaller wavelengths, which means you need much smaller dx's and much smaller uh, uh, dh's. Okay. So here's a uh, here's a gradient of a uh, a wave field, right? Uh, it's a, a, a vector. You know, dp dx, dp dy, and dp dz are the components of the vector, and you take the Hamiltonian, right? Del squared p, which is like uh, which is del dot del uh, applied to p, right? So that's uh, d squared p dx squared plus d squared p dy squared. Plus d squared p dz squared. All right. So um, now uh, here's a you know here's the definition of the derivative. As you uh, whoops oh okay that's not bad. Uh, I want to go back anyway. Sorry. <laughs> um, there's the definition of the uh, of the derivative, and uh, you know dp d dx. Is the limit as uh, as uh, delta x goes to zero of uh, p at x plus delta x minus p at x uh, div all divided by delta x? Okay. Now here's the finite difference operator. We take we estimate dp dx with the big D uh, difference operator in x. So big D x applied to p is very simply you know dropping the limit. Uh, p at x plus delta x minus p at x divided by delta x, and so then d squared p dx squared, um, and uh, notice I I I, I uh, quietly uh, got around the issue of uh, applying d minus first and d plus, or maybe I thought it was too difficult to put the subscript in as the superscript in as well. So you have uh, you know dx applied at uh, Big dx applied at uh, uh, p at x plus delta x. You have d, and you subtract uh, uh, d uh, big d uh, in x uh, applied at p at x, and then you divide again by delta x. So the whole thing, of course, <laughs> arg. Um, the whole thing is um, is as you know, uh, p at x plus delta x minus two p at x plus p at x minus delta x. All divided by delta x squared. All right. So um, uh, we can uh, we can find this uh, closed form uh, solution uh, to the uh, to the difference. All right. And um, what I want to what I want to examine here is this little example of the uh, the accuracy of the double finite difference. Okay. Um, and just remember, the Courant condition gives us a maximum dt from the maximum velocity. Okay. Um, now, uh, but what is this? Uh, what's what's involved with estimating those uh, second spatial derivatives? You know, which uh, all the wave numbers depend on. Okay. And you know already from uh, 706 that you know there's a limit to the accuracy of the uh, uh, of the uh, there's a there's a limit to the uh, the accuracy of the you know and, and you've seen the curve that relates the estimated uh, wave number k hat to the real wave number k, okay, using this second difference. Um, all right, so here's that same. Uh, that same uh, 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 sine wave, okay, and uh, you know so that's uh, p of x, okay. We're just looking at one dimension here, and uh, let's say we we have four samples per wavelength, okay. So um, um, we have uh, uh, you know here this sample is at one, that sample is at zero, that's at minus one, that's at zero, okay. Now um, we want to estimate the uh, the second derivative and calculate the uh, the second difference, right? The uh, 
Uh, and, and let's look first here at the zero crossing, right? The, uh, the second derivative at that zero crossing is, uh, is zero. OK? You, you guys know that already. So um, now what is the second difference? OK? So according to the second difference that we, that we set up above, OK, we have uh, uh, 1 minus 2 times 0 plus minus 1. OK, and so that uh, comes out that we're estimating 0. And uh, well, we expected that, right? When we, when we um, you know, we know that, that it's easy for the second difference to approximate the, uh, the second derivative for low spatial frequencies, right, for low k. And, and this is the lowest k possible, 0, OK, the smallest k possible, all right? What about at this point? This is at a maximum of uh, of k, right? So it's uh, uh, zero minus two times minus one plus zero, okay? And so uh, the second dif the second difference gives us two. Um, my I, I'm assuming delta x is one. I mean this one here. Uh, let's see. But see here, I'm I'm uh, I've changed the. Uh, oh, see, okay, delta x equals one here in this calculation, and here delta x equals two. So here, right, I've got, according to uh, uh, Nyquist theory, right, I've got a perfectly adequate representation of this wave, right? So this red approximation is a great approximation of the wave. Yeah. Okay. So so you know why is that too high fre a frequency for the second difference? Okay. So here, I mean, it's still going to match at uh, at at zero here, right? It's uh, you know, if, if, if we were, I mean, I don't have a point there, but uh, if I mash it here, um, you know, I would get zero, and that, that's accurate, okay? But um, um, what about at this point, you know, where it's minus one, okay? The second difference is, uh, you know, and we have delta x equals two, we have uh, one minus two times minus one uh, plus one. And then we got to take that sum, which is four, and divide it by four, which is delta x squared, right? And so we get one, okay? And what should it really? What what is it theoretically, right? Um, so here I work out the second derivative, d squared p dx squared, which is uh, minus four pi squared over four squared times minus one. That's two point four seven. So one, of course, is a very poor approximation of 2.47. And that's why you know, we did OK here. Um, right? 2 is what the second difference gives us. And that's a reasonable approximation. Well, I, I say here, I mean, maybe it's not a great approximation, but it's a, I say it's a much more reasonable approximation of 2.47 than is 1. Okay. So uh, uh, that uh, uh, that tells us that uh, um, you know this uh, this uh, uh, two samples per wavelength, while adequate for uh, the current condition, is totally inadequate for the uh, the second difference. Now, if I if I I should go through here and calculate to, you know the fourth order um, differences. And you know this would be better, but still inadequate. And this one actually is inadequate. Uh, uh, even in fourth order, right? You still need uh, uh, you still need um, uh, six points per wavelength. We've only got four, right? Uh, and for this second uh, the second order second difference, right? Um, we need twenty points per wavelength. And uh, you know so this is uh, this two. 
is better, but it's clearly not good enough. Uh, it's not a good enough approximation of 2.47. On the right-hand side, if yeah. you just increase the sampling points by interpolation, that would be just as good as the left-hand side, right, in that case? Ah, how would I do the interpolation? Along the straight lines? Yeah. Um, uh, It'd be like exactly the same as the left hand side, right? Uh, hmm. So you just take the average of those two points? Yeah, but it would be off at, uh, at other. Um, yeah, but if you just did it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the, you know, the linear approximation is going to be off at when you have other, you know, this is basically at zero phase. Yeah. And if you, if you shifted it to, uh, it would work at 0, 90, you know, 180, 270. Uh -huh. But at, uh, uh, you know, like at 30 degrees phase, I bet it would, it would not work. You still get these pretty substantial uh, differences yeah. or, or, or errors in estimating the, the derivative. Well, I mean, the same problem if instead of your sampling points being at the maxes, if those are just at the zero crossings anyways. Because even if you have two samples per cycle, if they're not positioned correctly, you're going to have the same problem. It's going to look like a flat line, right? Um, or if it wasn't, even if it was just like maybe halfway down. No, this, uh, you know, this is an accurate enough representation of the, of the wave, no matter what phase, you know, what the phase shift is. You know, two samples per wavelength, right? We know that already. Well, what if the two samples per wavelength, though, were just at the zero crossings? Um, hmm. You think you're just that is two samples per wavelength, isn't it? Yeah, and you'd have the same problem. Or if they're even adjusted, like let's say you shifted them like 30 degrees, like you were saying, it would just be, it wouldn't never hit the true maximums. You'd still have a problem with that. Yeah, right. So why why is that not so? Because we know we know from Fourier theory that, that so, it is adequate. I, I think but it's not it, we're, so we're missing something maybe here. This is why you need the six samples. Well I don't think it's 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 not perfectly accurate in all cases. It's the theoretical maximum, right? Like theoretically if you hit it on those maximums, then it would be correct, but it could also be incorrect if you didn't hit it on those maximums. Right, right, right. Yeah, I, I see that. So I don't think it's that it's correct. It's that it could theoretically be correct. But but uh, um, um, you know, for, Fourier said, and and uh, then I think uh, um, Nyquist proved that that no matter what the phase, it's it's perfectly adequate. Hmm. Um, but and we're not we're not seeing that right now, so we we have to you know we have to pull out a book on uh, Fourier theory and well, and look at look that. The phase, not the well, yeah, and it would still depend on where you sampled within the phase. Right, right, right. Yeah, why does why does this not appear to work for a pure sine wave? Um, no, but the 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 two you know the two. Um, the two samples per wavelength has got to be uh, has got to be, you know, enough. It is. I mean, if you were at the zeros, it would be your phase would be going 90, 270, 90, 270, 90, 270. You'd still pick it up. That's because uh, uh, because we're not including the uh, the uh, the imaginary part. Yeah, but we're just talking. We're but the Nyquist criterion works for all real as well. I think that's why it's confusing. Yeah, if you if you had the imaginary part, that would work. Because you you'd pick it up. Yeah, you'd still pick it up in the phase. It's just not yeah, but the the Nyquist criterion works perfectly for uh, um, for uh, you know all with with no imaginary part. It's not required. But I can't explain to you at the moment why why that's so. Uh, yeah, I have to, I to pull out my Fourier theory like book. If we sampled that at only the zero crossings, there's no other wave that can fit that besides well, that one, so we'd still know what it is. The information is still in there. 
but then you lose the amplitude information of the of the wave. Right, but you still capture the frequency. Well, if you had that's true. If you sample at the zero cost in the same way, it could either be that or 180 degrees of that. Yep, yep. There's that uncertainty. But you still capture the frequency correctly. Yeah, you would. You would. It's like a sine bit. It's like a sine bit representation of the wave. But you did say that Clayton found you have to have at least six samples for the wave. That's for the that's for the second derivative to work. Right. That's what I'm saying though. Like this problem wouldn't happen. You're not. You're never going to be able to hit all the zero crossings if you have only six samples for this. So that would sort of resolve this issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but we're 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 scratching our heads as to why the Nyquist criterion works. You know, for even for the current condition. Um, yeah, I see your point. Uh, and you can see that my my example cleverly avoids that issue. Um, so so you know maybe we just have to go back and rederive the uh, rederive the the Nyquist criterion. Because um, yeah, I, I agree. With you. I I don't see it right now. So I got to convince myself. Okay, so what do you see if you um, if you put two if you induce e three d because you can induce e three d, you know up to any frequency with any frequency up to the current condition. It you know e three d will not allow you to to uh, um, and, and the other codes will not allow you to violate the current condition. Okay, uh, but uh, they will allow you to put in frequencies that are too high. And will generate too much grid dispersion, which is nice. I take advantage of that, and, and I, I typically allow more grid dispersion than some of my colleagues do. And then I have to make the argument that it's not uh, it's not having um, an overwhelming effect. So here's an illustration of what a particular you know this is a, a small low frequency grid. So this is uh, uh, what the wave fronts look like uh, when the uh, when there's no grid dispersion. And here's what the wave fronts look like if I use like five times too high a frequency. And what are they doing? You can see that the waves are um, they're not able to propagate diagonally. The highest frequency waves are not able to propagate. Um, they're 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 mostly. What's happening here is that the uh, the k's, the derivatives, the k's are are being estimated too low. What does that mean? That means that the waves hang out on the directions that are orthogonal to the axes. Okay, so there the waves are propagating up and down and left and right and uh, uh, and north and south just fine, right? But uh, where they should be propagating in a circular way, the high frequency parts of the waves are dispersing, and they're propagating more slowly, and they're following the uh, you know they're following this cubicle. Uh, wavefront uh, kind of uh, kind of thing. So that uh, uh, you know that's uh, an example of what happens when you destroy, when you completely destroy your uh, your uh, uh, your calculation with uh, uh, with high frequencies that, that don't belong there. Um, so next time when I go through the setup of uh, a uh, uh, an earthquake uh, simulation. Um, I will show you exactly the practical considerations that come um, uh, in um, uh, that come into uh, uh, you know obeying the Courant condition and obeying the um, and keeping too much grid dispersion out of the calculation. All right. So maybe for next time. Um, if you guys can think of an earthquake scenario in in uh, California, Nevada, Arizona, or Utah that you want to model, um, then we could actually set it up, and we could we could run it in not too much time, you know, for low frequencies because of this uh, grid dispersion issue. So, uh, yeah, come back tomorrow with a uh, with an. Uh, California, Nevada, uh, Utah, or uh, Arizona earthquake scenario in mind.